Okay, biosynthetic pathways. This is uh, sort of the last part of metabolism I'm going to talk about, and it kind of leads into what our discussion on genetics will be. So I call this getting from A to B, uh, because it's all about how you start with one thing and then you end with another. So uh, all organisms not only break down chemicals in catabolism, they also have to make chemicals in anabolism. Um, and uh, macromolecules, which are the building, the, the, the standard building blocks of life, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, um, those you usually build by polymerizing smaller building blocks. Proteins are made out of amino acids. Um, DNA is made out of uh, nucleic acids. Uh, polysaccharides are made out of sugars. Uh, lipids are usually made out of fatty acids. So you build big things out of small things. But where do the small things come from? Where do amino acids and sugars and nucleotides come from. And it kind of depends on the type of organism that you are. Uh, if you are an organo-heterotroph, um, and specifically if you are like an, a, a primarily consumer animal, uh, like we are, we get most of our amino acids and, you know, sugars and lipids and things like that from eating stuff that have them. Like we eat something that has proteins and then we digest it and turn it into amino acids and then we use those amino acids to build our own proteins. Um, but unless you have an exceptionally well-balanced diet, you need to make some of them on your own. And if you are a bacteria uh, or any other microbe, chances are pretty good that you're not just finding a ready supply of all the amino acids that you could possibly want lying around in your environment. Um, you are probably going to have to make if, not just some, but a significant quantity of those building blocks on your own. <laughs> So, uh, microbes particularly have to spend a significant amount of energy building the building blocks, building amino acids, building nucleic acids, and things like that. And we talked a little bit about how some of the uh, metabolic pathways, like say the uh, pentose phosphate pathway, will give you precursors things that can be turned into those, uh, th those building blocks. But how do they get turned into those building blocks? So let's say that you're a bacteria and you have a chemical that we're going to call A. All right? A is something that is either common in the environment or it's something that you're already making for some other reason, all right? Uh, might be citrate or glucose or uh, ammonia, who knows? It's something that you can just easily find in the environment. And you want to get B. And B is, you know, kind of, sort of similar to A, plus a few other things. And it would be great if you just had an enzyme that was like an A-B convertase. Just takes A, boom, converts it to B. And while there are a few times when that's the case, it's usually not. Typically, if you have A and you need B there is a multi-step process that's going to take you from A to B. 
because enzymes are simple tools. They typically do one specific chemical reaction. They do it very well. But unless the A and B are super close together, it's probably going to take more than one chemical reaction in order to get there. So let's take a start here, right? You're starting with A. If you want to get to B, you know, the first thing that you might want to do is, uh, all right, so we're going to take that A and we're going to have an enzyme come in and cut off that second leg because we don't need that for B. B's really only got, you know, one big, long, straight line. By the way, um, we might call that type of enzyme a hydrolase um, because it's, it's uh, cutting away a piece, or, or it may be named after the specific chemical reaction involved. All right, if we want to get to B, this, this is tilted the wrong way, so we're going to have another enzyme come in, yink, change the shape. Uh, enzymes that change the shape of something without adding or subtracting anything from it are typically called isomerases. Okay, now we're getting kind of closer. Um, we're going to need to add some stuff to it, though. So in our next step, we're going to add a couple of lines and uh, enzymes that uh, add things to a molecule might be called synthases, um, or they might be named after the chemical reaction that they do. And then we're pretty close, so maybe in this last step, we're just going to attach those final two pieces, and boom, we've gone from A to B. Now, it wasn't one step. We had to do a bunch of different things. We had to cut a few things away. We had to change the shape. We had to add things to it. Each of those steps is being done by a different enzyme. And we're going to need, like, the lines and the little curvy bits to add on to it. Those are going to be other precursor molecules. Um, and this process is going to be fairly energy intensive. It's very anabolic. It's often going to involve using uh, electron energy from NADPH, um, probably using a significant amount of ATP. So it's not cheap, but if you need B, it's the way you gotta get there. So each of these steps has a separate enzyme that does it, typically controlled by a separate gene. Sometimes in a pathway, like you're going to have intermediate steps that are useful in and of themselves. So on this path from A to B, we ended up with E right here, right? If we needed E, we could stop here and just use E, or maybe we can just take some away and then use some to make the rest of B. You also sometimes have branch points. Like from this E stage, we could either use this enzyme to attach the curly bits and get B, or we could use the second enzyme to cut the bottom off and get F. An important thing to keep in mind as we move into the next section is that each of these steps is controlled by a different enzyme. And each of those enzymes is usually going to be coded for by a different gene. So if we mutate genes, say we hit this bacteria that's doing this A to B thing with a mutation gun, and we just zap, we mutate a gene. We don't know what gene we mutated, but then we go take a look at our bacteria and we find that they can't make B anymore but they can still make E and F. Well, now we know which enzyme was mutated. 
this one because it's by breaking this enzyme here, we're gonna stop making B, but still have a clear path to making E and F. If we were to destroy that enzyme there, or this enzyme back here, then this bacteria would no longer be able to make B, E, or F. Uh, an, uh, an organism that has been mutated in such a way that it can no longer make something that it used to make on its own and now has to have that supplied to it, right? So if this enzyme were broken, the bacteria could no longer make B. And if it's going to live, you're going to have to give it B in its media. We would call that an oxotroph. It is a mutation that causes an additional nutritional requirement. If we mutated this gene back here, then the bacteria would now need E, F, and B added to it, would be an oxytroph. Unless it has another pathway by which it can make E or F other than this. And sometimes bacteria do have redundant pathways. It's a thing that happens sometimes. So important things to keep in mind about biosynthetic pathways. A, they are anabolic, right? B, they are multi-step, and the steps usually have to occur in a sequence. C, if you break an early step, it means that you can't proceed past that point. D, often you will have intermediate projects or products or branch points that lead to alternate products. All right, that's basically what I got to talk about there.